online, and then I'm going to present to you a case study uh, which actually shows how we put these principles into practice. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk fast, uh, but uh, here we go. Uh, so let's talk, talk about the best thing about lean. So we've been at this for a long time, and clearly the best thing about lean is that everything can be tested, right? All the best ideas rise from the top. Um, it is cool for a senior executive or a junior, like the most junior person in the company, they're on equal footing, and you get this crazy dopamine rush every time an experiment goes your way, right? And when it, when it goes your way, you're like the smartest people in the world, you feel like you've cracked the code and you're finally going to make it, um, and that's great. It won't be a better feeling. Uh, which brings me to the worst part of it. Uh, which is also that everything can be experimented with. Um, and when you've been using what basically happens is very often uh, the experimentation becomes a crutch and it becomes a tool to substitute judgment. And that's a problem. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that by way of example. So um, it's cool to fail, right? So now that we've, one of the, we've all come to understand that, that it's not a big deal to fail at meetup. Uh, failure is not a big deal as long as you're learning something and you're advancing towards a larger goal. And uh, Every new person that joins the company goes through an orientation meeting. So we're 100 people now, we're going to be 130 by the end of next year. A lead engineer or the new receptionist, they will all go through an orientation system meeting. And in that, I'll walk them through five or six experiments that we've run. And I will force everyone to guess what the outcome was. And of course, I rigged the deck. <laughs> and they're going to, more, more often than not, they're lucky if they get 50% of the answers right. And so here they are with one of the most senior people in the company. And they're failing like on day one. And it's probably like a very humbling or humiliating experience. I hope it's more humbling than humiliating. Because uh, that's certainly not my intention. But what I want to really get the point across is that it is cool to fail. It's great to try things. And that's done as it's armed us in a way that we are very driven towards experiment, experiment, experiment. Now, what I've noticed with all these experiments we've run is that there are generally three kinds of problems. There's your win that kind of unfolds that is like a marathoner's it's like getting a drink of water for a marathon on our way towards the finish line. Uh, and those are your kind of growth wins that are tied to a key metric that um, are kind of a small win that gets you closer and closer to your goal. Sort of like what Reed Hoffman was talking about today. Those growth, those growth hacks of sorts, those things that get you closer to your goals. Then you've got your breakthrough wins. Right? These, this is Alvin Kelvin, I probably butchered his last name. But he's credited with being a pioneer of the straight leg hurdle jump. So prior to, to him, people used to run up to hurdles and then try to leap over them. And he's credited with being able to, the first person to be able to take it in stride. And what he was able to do is by just changing that slight technique, he didn't reinvent running, like he, like, he kind of did, he didn't reinvent the sport, um, but he just had a slight modification that created this breakthrough win for him. Uh, and he was able to go on and be the first person to win four gold medals, medals in the Olympics. So again, a small change can lead to a huge difference on a breakthrough level. You string up these together, and you can get massive breakthroughs, right? So these are the, you know, your earth-changing, your world-changing uh, wins on the way. So those are two of the three wins, right? And that brings me to my third kind of win. And that's for meaningless win, right? <laughs> these are, this is a bull barrel running down the street in, uh, in uh, old school. But these are meaningless wins. There, there's no good reason why you should be uh, doing bull barrels, and there's no good reason why you're running this experiment in the first place. But you're doing it because you can't. Is a, is a gray button better than a red button? Does a, yeah, does a, can we optimize this experience that nobody on our app goes to? Who cares? Right? That's, that's the problem. Um, and so you've got these three kinds of wins, and all the experiments are generally going to fall into one of those buckets, unless they're a failure, of course. Um, and so how do you tell them apart at the beginning? How do you think about them? The way that I've come to learn to think about them is uh, using a framework that Hunter Walk taught us. Uh, taught me, and, uh, he gave me a talk and meet up a little while back. And in it, he presented the bank for buck matrix. Uh, and here, you basically look at the magnitude of your potential payoff, and you compare that on the, mag on the magnitude of the effort that's involved. You don't have crystal balls, so you're just guessing. You really don't know how much effort it's really going to take, and you really don't know how much payoff you're really going to get. But you're going to make the guess. You take all the projects you could be working on, and you sort of rank order them this way. So clearly, everything that's going to be a, a big win, and it's going to require very little effort, is going to be a start. You're going to do as much of these as you possibly can. Right, and conversely, you want to stay away from projects that have the opposite characteristics. Which leaves the question as to what do you do with the remaining two buckets? Now, I used to be indifferent between these two. Uh, so, you know, ten small wins should equal one big win, right? What's the big deal? Um, in fact, I was wrong. Uh, and 
what often happens, especially in software, is that these small wins that, this, that require a little effort very often end up requiring a lot more than a little effort. And when that happens, those small wins actually just become dumps. Um, and what they look more like to me is junk food. They give you that kind of great little high, a good feeling. I just you know, flew in New York from New York. I went to the internet as soon as I possibly could. Uh, and boy, was I sorry. That's the feeling I have after I run one of these experiments. Uh, and the, really, the place where you're going to want to invest all your time and effort after you've had the opportunity to exhaust all of the things that you up front are guessing are stars are your worth events. And so, what I'll talk a little bit about now is our lessons learned in pursuing those worthy bets. So here's the approach that we take. Uh, it generally starts with a design-oriented vision of the experience we want to create. Well, often there's a step before that, there's a level of understanding. We get insights about what we think is going on. And then we craft a vision for what is it that we want to create. We validate that vision in our usability lab. And once we're cool with that, we run it and we run live tests against it. And then we repeat the whole thing. But, of course, it's not a linear process. Uh, it goes through many, 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 many iterative loops. It's a project I'm working on now that is on, I think, uh, Rev 28. Uh, and so the best way to illustrate this is actually just actually showing you a project that we did recently, uh, which is kind of a fun little case study. Uh, here it is. So uh, a few years ago, to start a meetup group, you had to go through this five-step process. And it looks like it's straight out of 2002. Uh, it has all the charm of a tax form, and uh, maybe not, <laughs> but tax forms might even have more charm. But we, I had a brainstorm one night with our lead designer, and he went home that night, and he was inspired, and he came back with something that looked like this. I'm going to just show you. He came back with a, a working prototype of something that had nothing to do with our website that looked like this, and I'll show it to you. So this is not on meetup.com, this just happens to be hosted on my domain, but, but actually at the time it was on his. He did it, so don't think I'm just going to code it, because I'm not. Um, he said, what if when you start a meetup group, instead of that clunky form, you're sort of presenting something a little more fun, it says, what's your name, and what kind of meetup do you want to start, it says, you want to start an outdoors one, and so you get a nice little photo, and the experience then unfolds in a way that's really tied to that, to that category. Pretty exciting, so let's say we want it to be Studies. It's incredibly inexpensive. 
expensive even at this scale. Uh, here's how it looks. So, uh, Brenna here is our moderator, uh, and then you have somebody who came in for testing. Uh, they will sit in front of a computer together before the test. Our moderator will fire up GoToMeeting uh, and send out an email to the team of people who are working on whatever project. So let's say there's that project there, uh, the meetup create flow. They'll send out an email, she'll send out an email saying, hey, tune into this GoToMeeting. They will tune in at their desks uh, at that time. They'll just have their headphones on. They can watch the session in real time um, on their computers and listen in on the time that's, that's, that their stuff is being tested. Uh, and so, obviously, whatever they, they can hear whatever's happening, whatever the, model, whatever the tester's saying, they can see what the tester's got on their screen. Uh, and then there's a real-time feedback channel that happens back through IM. So we don't do scripts or any of other uh, nonsense. Uh, and basically, what you see there is the, is the uh, that allows us to basically adapt and, and the team can ask questions directly to the subject um, at the drop of a hat. Here's an example of that, of that uh, test of that text. So we were testing for this, we were te testing uh, different color palettes. And we were, uh, so there I was trying to get insight on, hey, what did she call the, uh, how many was she hoping to find? Uh, and then Brett was able to ask and really get really insight right away. So uh, that's one of the nuts and bolts, but the overall objective here is we want to shorten the amount of time to anyone in the company wondering how someone would use something or react to something and actually watching them react. Um, and we do that because it's something that we've been talking about for years, but I can't be up on stage and not show the slides, it's my favorite slide ever. Uh, it's a mountain which class, right? Which is the tendency to believe that everyone uses technology the way you do. So if you have an iPhone, you can't understand that Droid is actually the most popular operating system uh, in the world. If you use Gmail, every conversation is threaded. If you've never clicked on an ad, you can't believe that anyone does, let alone that it's a billion dollar industry. Uh, and the cure for the malware bias is simply watching people use the stuff you build. Um, that's why we invest a relatively modest sum, but it has a disproportionate impact on the company. It's super easy to do. You can do it yourself. I can give an hour-long presentation on it, but I already have. You can find a link to it, to it here. Uh, so that's the usability portion. That's what we do at the end with usability. So let's take our resume our story over here. All right. So we had the user tell. We had some users come in. We had them go through this flow. What do you think happened? They loved it. Good. This is actually sort of like an orientation session. Yeah. Uh, wrong. Actually, they, 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 well, you were right and wrong. So, they were thoroughly, they were confused on step one. They didn't know why they needed to put their name. And they were stuck on step two. They couldn't figure out how the category system worked. But, uh, as you said, they did love the way it unfolded. And so, uh, we saw this consistently over two or three tests. And we said, all right, well, let's just go back to the drawing board and say this is not... Uh, this whole category thing, the original concept, is a fail, but the way that it unfolds is pretty cool. So, what if we iterated on it? So we iterated on it, and it basically ended up looking a lot more like this. Where you can start, with basically, it looks like this, you start meetup group, you tell them what it's, what it's called, where is it, uh, then you select where it is, blah, blah, blah. Description and voila, you told how many people are going to join, and that was the number one thing that we saw people want. So, we, we've got a great prototype now that actually is really dynamite and is working solidly in user testing. Now, what we do? Uh, here's what we did. Now, we, we brought it to live testing. So, what we did from here is we uh, said if, if, in fact, this new experience is significantly better than the other one, which we feel it is, uh, then if we just replace step one with a new experience and then dropped you back on this ugly old experience, we should still see a win. So we tested that first, and we saw a win. It was awesome. So then we tested, we ran another test, and then another, and another, and so on and so forth, eventually ending up with what we have now, which is similar to what I showed you there, but actually deviated in interesting ways. So if you go click on Start Meetup uh, on our site, uh, then you'll see uh, exactly what the final product looks like. Uh, and we're using this exact same methodology in our $28 iPhone rig, which is really just a tripod, a paint stick, a desktop, and a webcam uh, to test out the exact, uh, something similar with the mobile experience. Um, so that, that's how we think about those big ones. That's how we work. Um, we don't totally write off the small wins, though. So be aware of the small wins. Um, kind of a little bit of advice I really feel that I need to share. So if you hear someone justify a project, by virtue of the amount of time it's going to take to execute that project, that it's only going to take a day or two, you should be 
beware. That is probably something that's not going to be worth doing. Uh, if you hear somebody say, we got a 12% lift in adoption from this flow, um, you should ask, well, what's that represent better in adoption overall? Is that actually a meaningful win? Is that 12% overall? Or is that actually point oh, 12% in the big picture? Um, and if you're going to do the small wins, but focus on the, as, as, uh, as uh, Reed Hoffman was talking about earlier, focus on your key vital metrics. Design things in a way that they're super low cost. And while the way we're thinking about these like low cost uh, experiments, and we've been designing something called split test banding. And what it does is it allows us to um, take really small potential wins, do small things like the subject line. And rather than have a team of people be devoted to swapping in and swapping out subject lines, we'll load up 30 different subject lines, for example. Uh, and we'll run them in a split test banded, uh, where each one of them will kind of get a turn and get several turns at being tested. Um, and what will happen is, is that basically, but this is an example of three, of three different emails that are being tested. Um, but basically what happens is that the system will keep sending and will test everything equally. But as one begins to show that it's better than the others, it will automatically get more weight. And people will start sending more and more. Uh, so the system will automatically start sending more and more uh, of that test case to people. Uh, eventually still testing the other ones, but making sure that the, the thing that's winning actually goes. What that allows us to do is make sure that we're not devoting tons of human energy debating uh, and doing human intervention, which sucks up all of the value. Um, so again, micro usability program is all about how do you make it so that it's as low cost as possible to run these experiments. And if the ongoing incremental cost of running the test is very low, then it's super easy to do, and then it's justified. To do. So, in conclusion, you know the big lessons learned here in validating vision is go after your big wins uh, with systematic validation. Ditch the meaningless things. Stay away. Run, run, run. Uh, and yet, these smaller ones are like five bucks in your pocket.